Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our COP online evening service. It's great to have you with us tonight. We're going to have an awesome time in His Word and worship. We're going to start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. For our praise moment today, we are going back to Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm, reminding us that we are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. We belong to him and he is our good shepherd. Amen. But he is going to do something wonderful for us in verse 5, which we are going to today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, I guess the important thing is, who is the you that we're talking about here? Who is preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies? Who is the you? You know, sometimes when someone messages you or texts you and you don't have that person in your contacts, and so you'll text back and say, who you? <laughs> well, from Psalm 23, verse 5, who you? Who is you? Who's preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies? You know the passage in John chapter 18, where Judas arrives in the garden to betray Jesus, and he's leading the men right to him. And Jesus asks, who are you looking for? And they told him, and he said, I am he. And when Jesus said, I am he, immediately they all fell to the ground, including, it says they all fell to the ground, including Judas, who was at that very time possessed by Satan. So there it is, all of Jesus's enemies on their faces before him, including the devil. And in spite of that, in spite of this powerful Jesus, Yet he chose to go with them and to give his life as a ransom for us. Amen. And then in Israel, when we are there and we visit the garden tomb and we visit Caiaphas's house, underneath Caiaphas's house, there is a dungeon. Yes, under the, <laughs> the religious leader's house, there was a dungeon. It's where Jesus spent his last night, and we get to go down there. And of course, his last night before being crucified, I should say. It's Of course, it's cleaned up now, but then it was filthy. It was a filthy hole underneath Caiaphas' house. Well, Jesus, who walked on water, Jesus, who raised the dead, at any moment, 
he could have just walked right out of that stone dungeon, that rock dungeon, and been free. He could have walked right out, or he could have called 10,000 angels to come and rescue him. But he chose to stay there because he loves us. Because he loves us, he chose to give his life for us. So when God himself, God who walks on water, God who stayed, who chose to stay in that dungeon in Caiaphas' house, though he could have walked out, God, mighty God, who spoke, I am he, and all of his enemies fell face down before him. When God himself is there, and he is the one preparing a table before you. <laughs> Can your enemies harm you there? Can they just wait till you're eating and then rush up against you? Oh, right. I think you know the answer. Absolutely not. Yes, in the presence of my enemies, but a greater yes in the presence of my powerful God, my powerful, omnipotent, in fact, Savior, before whom enemies fall on their faces. David had enemies. Every good man has enemies. Jesus himself had enemies on this earth. But God's superior power is such that even when your enemies look on helplessly from the sidelines, <laughs> they will watch as God blesses you with his best. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to worship our wonderful, powerful God together for a few moments. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we ask for your touch in our lives. Father, we want to come to you and be changed. Lord, we want to be changed in your presence. We don't want to just come to church.
Before we get into the word tonight, testimonies are important and you need to share yours also. It is an important way for you to not only give God glory, but share with others what God has done for you because what God has done for you, God will do for them. All right, so please send us those testimonies, not advertisings of your business, all right, please send us those testimonies. We've got one for you right now. Hello, COP. This is Brother RV. And this is Sister Shasha. And today we want to share to you how God has been good to our family. Now, just like every other family, we also had problems. And the biggest one that we experienced is when I lost my job because of the pandemic. And uh, as the head of the family, we all know that the need to provide is always there. And during the season, yung mga babayarin eh, hindi naman siya mag-stop, especially the bills and the tuition fees. And we are consuming our savings and the thought of him start starting all over again uh, after so many years na binil niya yung career na yun. And also the fact that it's not that easy to land a good job right now. So every time na may fear kami nararamdaman, as a family, we made sure na we focus on the promises of God. We rest on His faithfulness. And Every day, we join sis, uh, Pastor Samral and, and Sister Bev sa daily devotion and every night sa online service. And uh, also, we make we, we attend the Fortress 91 at least once a week. And especially when the services are back, uh, as an usher, we, we went were, back uh, to serve the Lord. We were very excited. Now, um, since day one that he lost his job, uh, God gave us His word that whatever the enemy has taken away from us, God will give it back to us twofold. It says in Zechariah 9.12, uh, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare I declare to you double. And after several uh, interviews and disappointments, uh, may dumating na magandang opportunity for me and we really focused on this one we prayed for this one specifically and we, we prayed for specific uh, job offers mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, packages and praise God uh, dumating yung blessing and it was actually more than enough it, it was uh, the, you know it, the, the blessing that we received is what we prayed for and more plus uh, the position that was offered it was another uh, to promotion. Me, it's, it's it was higher than my previous position, and and the company is way better than my previous one. It says in the word in First Peter two six, those who trust in the Lord will not be disappointed. And true enough, in Psalms one twenty six when uh, one twenty six one, when the Lord restored the for the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. It was like a dream. <laughs> Amen. So, COP, we want to encourage you. Let's keep praying. Let's keep on holding on to God's promises. And most especially, let's go back to the house of the Lord and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, we've been parked here in this first part of Romans 8, 28 to 39 for quite a while now. and We're probably going to be parked there all this week. Paul says, and we know, this is one of those we knows, a statement of faith. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So we've been working together to walk across these beautiful stones that Paul has laid out for us. We've been walking in these footsteps of beautiful stones. These are not pillars of truth. These are sequential stones that we walk upon. God's foreknowledge of our life. God's predestination of our life. God's calling us into a relationship. God's justification of our lives and God's glorification of our lives. Now, we've gone through foreknowledge and predestination. We've been parked for a few days on calling because that deals with our salvation, and it's a big deal. So let's try to finish up calling today. Let's talk about the purpose of our calling of salvation. It is a purpose of family. It's for the purpose of relationship. Now, we're going to get more into this this weekend because we're actually starting back up 1 Corinthians this weekend in chapter 7. We're going to begin around verse 16 or verse 17 in chapter 7. 
But Paul has to lay out to the church in Corinth that our calling to salvation did not change our social status in life or our social position in life. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 20 to 24, each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, he who is a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought with a Christ. Don't be slaves of men. Brothers, each man is responsible to God, should remain in the situation God called him. Now, just because in God's foreknowledge and God's predestination, God has known you, that, that does not change the physical experiential circumstances that you have in life. For instance, if you're in prison when you get saved, <laughs> you're still in prison. If you're a worker in the factory when you first get saved, you're still a worker in the factory. If you work in a BPO when you first get saved, then you still work in a BPO. If you're in debt when you first get saved, you're still in debt. If you're married when you get saved, you're, you're still in debt. Now, from this day forward, your circumstances may begin to change. But for right now, your decisions have brought you where you are today. Now, the reason I want to emphasize this is I can remember years ago, there were people who began to move around the world and teach that, that when you're born again, everything becomes new. Therefore, all of your debts, you don't have to pay them anymore. You know, all of your court cases, you're not responsible for them anymore. You know, whatever you did in the past is in the past. God has forgiven you, so there's no more debt to society. Uh, if you're married, you know, you don't have to be married to that woman because you married her in your unsaved state, and now God has a new wife for you as a Christian wife. And, you know, th there's all kinds of weird things. And I, I remember in the 1980s when this thing began to move through the world. I, I just stood back and shook my head, and I thought, now, Lord, I didn't grow up Christian. But when I got saved, I was still a student at the university. I still lived in the same dorm room. I was still the same person in one sense. My social position in life did not change by salvation. Now, yes, our attitudes toward those circumstances do change. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul said, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Notice, you were called to one hope when you were called. When you and I got saved, we were called to hope. So yes, this may be our position right now. You may be in prison. You may have a dead-end job that you don't like, but you were called to one hope. Hope is that confident expectation of future good. Your, your, your social position may be the same, but your attitude toward it is different. You don't see this as the end anymore. You always see hope. Ephesians 1 verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Now, see, everything about our, our attitudes toward the future changes when we're called into this relationship with God, the God of hope, the God of eternal encouragement, the God who makes a way when there is no way. You, you've got to understand, yes, your social position is the same. Maybe your husband is the biggest jerk in the universe, all right? But you're still married to him. Maybe your wife is the wicked witch of the East, but you're still married to her. But your attitude is different. Ah, your attitude is different. Now you see, if God changed me, God can change them. You look at your job. This isn't my future. God has a beautiful future for me. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do all things as unto the Lord. I'm going to be the best employee in the company, but God has something better for me in the future. You're always looking forward to the future. So, you know, again, this is a very simple distinction, but it is a distinction that needs to be made. And we'll really work on this this weekend in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We need to understand when we get saved, yes, we're a new creature in Christ. Behold, all things are made new, okay? But our social position, who we're married to, where we're working, where we live, what we're doing, those things are the same. But our attitude toward them is different. Hope has been brought into our life. Now, our spiritual position, however, our social position has not changed, but our spiritual position has changed drastically. Now, some of this I've taught you in detail in the past, so I can move through it quickly. You know, with us, 
from a spiritual position, there's no more human nationalities with us. There's no more room for for bigotry. There's no more room for nationalism and prejudice. There's no more room for that. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all one. I was watching a, a fascinating thing uh, by a, a Christian geneticist who's part of the creation projects and showing how that we are young earthers, that we are, you know, this earth is about 150 generations old and, you know, creation and Darwinism is not the truth, but the Bible is true. It was fascinating to listen to because as a geneticist, what he did is he traced the beginning of mankind from ancient Mesopotamia throughout the earth. And by genetics, he can trace it, how all of the genes of human beings spread around the world. And it's almost identical to what the secular geneticists have said, except the secular geneticists put it in Africa, and we would put it more like where the Garden of Eden is and where Noah's Ark came down to rest in that area. But it's, it's almost at an identical place. And he traced this all through, and he showed that, you know, it's not like these are different races. And I really liked his teaching. He said, it's not like mankind is a, a group of disparate races that were created. There, there was one human being created. And he said, you know, these human beings as they were created were probably what we would say, they probably looked Pinoy. They were probably a little olive skinned, a little brown skinned. And he said, you know, what happened is as people groups began to move out, there were genetic bottlenecks because of inbreeding. I mean, there wasn't that many human beings around. So there would have been inbreeding. And rather than having like one sixteenth of your great grandfather's genes because of the inbreeding, you would have had two thirds of your grandfather's genes. All right. So it was a beautiful study in showing how the, the inbreeding caused by the small population as it went off into the different areas of the world caused certain traits to be, um, become more prominent. Like if you saw my grandfather, I have my grandfather's nose. If you saw my grandfather, I have my grandfather's head. Now, amazing. Uh, just amazingly, if you would look at, if there was inbreeding in our family, then you would see baldness would become a dominant trait. Well, you know, it is a dominant trait in, in Scotland where all of my ancestors came from because there was a genetic bottleneck caused by inbreeding. So he goes on and he lays all this out very beautifully. And then he closes everything out with this guy in Australia who fought in World War II. And his best friend that fought side by side with him in World War II was an Aborigine. So you have this guy who is snow white. He's just lily white. And you have an Aborigine. And these guys are best friends. Well, as they got older, he needed a kidney transplant. He had his kidneys failed. And they looked and looked and looked and they couldn't find a donor for his kidney. Well, his Aborigine friend came in and said, test me. He was a perfect match. You see, there are dominant traits caused by these bottlenecks of, of, of inbreeding as, as mankind spread out around the world. But bottom line, a human being is a human being is a human being. And when we come into a relationship with God, we are again reminded there is no black. There is no slanted eye or big nose. There is no bald there is no black or white or green or purple with yellow polka dots. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, it was a beautiful study, he, and he did it from genetics. But Paul teaches it to us from spiritual genetics. In spirituality, we get back to the core of how we were created. We're part of God's great family. Now, in God's great family, we have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the light. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you. Now, here's that calling. Called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So you've been called out of darkness. You've been called out of sin. And then he adopted you as sons. Now, we've taught you that in great detail and given us an inheritance. We taught you that also in great detail. Hebrews 9, verse 15, For this reason Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. All right, so we're, our, 
our physical social position has not changed, but our spiritual position has changed. We are part of a new social order called the family of God. Now, in addition to that, our relationship and our understanding of Jesus has changed. We see him as our elder brother. We now see him as firstborn. Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Firstborn gives him authority. Firstborn means he goes through all the experiences first. He does everything first. Uh, You know, if you were like me, you wore your brother's hand-me-down clothes. Jesus died first. Jesus rose again from the first. Jesus ascended first. He's the firstborn. He, He goes through everything first. And we see him as the wisdom and the power of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, remember the purpose of calling is what we're studying. To those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ, our our kuya, our our elder brother, to put it in very simple human terms, is the source of all the miracles. He is the power of God. He is the source of all the miracles. And he is the source of all the guidance. He is the wisdom of God. That's why Hebrews opens within these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the source of all the miracles. Jesus is the source of all the guidance that we need. So we look upon him a little differently than we we look upon the rest of the family. Now, you know, and the reason I belabor this point is that there are people that just want to treat Jesus like he's one of the family. Well, he's God. I mean, please forgive me. I, I don't get the Trinity. I will never understand the Trinity. My brain's not that big. I can give you all the theological arguments, but to tell you I understand it, I don't. One God, yet three parts. Okay, yeah, I can explain it all to you, but don't tell me that I get it. My brain's not that big yet. One day when I get to heaven, I'll get it all, okay? But there are many Christians that seem to downgrade Jesus in their understanding. They, they don't see him as God. They just see him as, well, you know, he's part of the family. He's, he's Kuya, and, you know, we can argue and fuss with Kuya. No, no, you don't argue and fuss with Jesus. God has put things to us in in a way that we can understand family relationships, but Jesus is God. He's the source of all the miracles. He's the source of all the guidance. But take one more look. Jude 1 verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who have been called. He said, "I'm, I'm writing to you who are called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. And kept by Jesus Christ. Ah, kept by Jesus Christ. Now add one more verse to that, then I'll talk about it. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, this is Jesus talking, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None of them was lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus, our Kuya, our elder brother, fully God, the source of all wisdom, the source of all miracles in our lives. He also keeps us. I taught you when we were going through how to take a stand in these evil days. After having done everything to stand, stand firm. How do we do that? He is able to make us stand. You see, I believe in the keeping grace of God. I believe we are kept by Jesus Christ. Notice that. Those who are loved by God the Father and kept, kept by Jesus Christ. Now, I've taught you repetitively that there are people who walk away from God. Now, I think it's a lot harder than you can ever imagine to get away from God. Yes, I believe that people can backslide. Yes, I believe people can lose their salvation. But I don't think you lose it. I think you you make decisions to persistently and constantly and, and stubbornly push God away from you. 
And part of the reason for that is I'm kept by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some of you, you've been, uh, you've been trying to get away from him. But you know what? It's kind of hard to get away from somebody who loves you so much. See, I, I don't think it's very easy to get away from him. Kept by Jesus Christ. When I was a young man, I was so happy to be saved. And in the little country church that I attended when I was in college, it was always Sunday night was all about backsliding, okay? <laughs> I used to say, Grandpa, I, I don't want to turn away from Jesus. Jesus has done so much for me. Grandpa, I don't ever want to backslide. Grandpa, I don't ever. And Grandpa would say, Davey, would you just calm down? And this is one of the verses. He taught me a lot of things, but this is one of the verses that he taught me. You're kept by Jesus Christ. You're kept. Now, some of you, your heart is good. Yes, you've done some stupid things. Yes, okay, we accept that. But you need to understand something. There's somebody watching over you. Jesus said, I protected them. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is protecting you. Just like I taught you last week in how predestination, God sets limits, set limits on Job, sets limits on temptation. Set limits for Peter when Satan said, I demand to sift him as wheat. She said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Satan shook him up, but his faith would not fail. Jesus prayed for him. That's part of his protection. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Some of you just need to, to just calm down and begin to relax and understand. There's somebody watching over you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just like he protected the 12, he's protecting you. Just like he kept them, he keeps you now. Just like he prayed for Peter, he's praying for you now. Kept by Jesus Christ. Now let's take it a step farther. Ephesians 4 verse 1. All right, so we understand our social relationships, our social position in life has not changed, but our spiritual position and our relationship and understanding of Jesus has changed. But now, how do we live worthy of this calling of salvation? How do we live worthy? Ephesians 4.1. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. All right, so the purpose of this calling should change our lifestyle. When you love somebody, your lifestyle reflects it by how you live. Let me read it to you in New Living Translation. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for which you have been called by God. What, what we do cannot make us worthy. What he has done for us is not because we were worthy. But now, because of what he has done for us, he asks us to live worthy, to live like who we are now. Now, how do we do this? First of all, we have to live worthy of this calling, live worthy of our relationship with God in our relationships with other people. Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, notice this next statement. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. New Living Translation. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for which you have been called by God. Be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another, making allowance for each other's faults. Because of your love. I like that. Making allowance for each other's faults. You know what? There's none of us perfect. You just have to learn to make allowance for each other's faults. Always keeping yourselves united in the Holy Spirit. And bind yourself together in peace. Now, now this is how we live as the family of God. First of all, we walk in humility in our relationships. Not not false humility, which is really pride in disguise, where we're always trying to get people to compliment us. But humility, Paul would define it as an honest evaluation, a sober estimate, an honest evaluation of yourself because of who we are in relationship with God. Now, the one thing you have to understand is family knows you, 
okay? You, you can try to act like something different around strangers, around people in class or school, but you know what? Family knows you. You can't get away with boasting. Family knows what you smell like when you've been sweating and working hard. Family knows how, family knows every mistake, every fault. I mean, please. <laughs> you you can't put on something in front of your your brothers and your sisters, especially now. Mom and dad will sometimes kind of smile at you, but your brothers and sisters ah, they're not going to take it for a minute. <laughs> okay, I mean it's just it's not going to happen. He says, so be completely humble. In other words, always have an honest evaluation of yourself. Okay, always have an honest evaluation of yourself. Secondly. Be gentle in your other relationships because of your call into a relationship with God. Now, I know sometimes that you have to be strong like Jesus in the, in the, in the, in the temple when he had to cleanse the temple. I, I understand that. And, and, you know, sometimes as a pastor, I have to be strong, but it should never be something that you enjoy, ever. Something that you have to do, but not something that you are or that you, that you enjoy. You know, 99.99% of the time, you should be completely gentle with others, not weak, gentle. You know, I, there were some foreigners here in the country one time, and they were pretty rude to some of our people. And they were pretty rude to me too. And I looked at these foreigners and I said, you know, with no respect, I said, because you don't, you don't deserve any respect the way you've been acting. I said, but with no respect. I said, let me just tell you something straight up. I said, our Filipino people are gentle, but we are not weak. And if you keep acting like the way you're acting, somebody's going to mess you up. And they just looked at me and I said, don't confuse gentleness with weakness. Our Filipino people are a gentle people, but we're not a weak people. And I said, you'll find our strength if you keep messing around. And they just backed up and looked at me. And you know, they treated everybody much nicer after that. Now, now gentleness, you have to understand, it's not weakness. It's strength under control. You know when I learned that? I was a young intern pastor in a little town called Canton, Illinois. It was my internship summer when I was in Bible school. The pastor's name there was Willis Wilson. He was a wonderful man and was very patient teaching me and training me. But I was out visiting one day, and I, I visited one of the older men in the church who worked at the International Harvester Manufacturing Company. He, I mean, they, they made these giant machines, International IH or International Harvester. And he ran this monstrous stamping machine where, you know, a piece of steel would be about that thick and he'd hit this button and this thing would come down and boom, and these parts would be stamped out. And, you know, he had these big things over his ears. And I mean, this was his job. Well, I was visiting during lunch hour one day and he, he said, let me show you my machine. And boom, he stamped one of those things out. And in my mind, all I was thinking about, you know, if my hand was under there, there would be nothing left but liquid. My hand would have just been a spot. I mean, I'm not even talking about any cells left. I mean, it would just be a spot. No bones, no nothing, just a spot. And he said, let me show you something. And he took a walnut and put a walnut in there. Well, I'm thinking, my goodness, that walnut <laughs> is going to vaporize. He pushed, the he pushed a button. And it came down so slowly and so gently and just touched the top of that walnut and cracked the shell open. He pushed another button and went up and he opened it up and handed me some of that walnut. He said, never forget this lesson, young man. Gentleness is strength under control. And you know what? As you can tell, that was when I was around, oh, 18 years old. And now I'm 64 years old and I've never forgotten that lesson yet. Think about how strong Jesus was. He could stand there and face down a crowd about to throw him off the precipice and walk back through the middle of them. As one man, one man, he could take a whip and drive all the money changers and everybody out of the temple courts. Can you imagine the strength, the force of that one man? Not a crowd of men, one man driving everybody out driving people away from their money and their businesses. The strength of Jesus. Yet look at his gentleness. Look at how he, look at how he, look at how he does things. 
Look at his gentleness with, with the woman whose, husband, whose son had died. Look at his gentleness with the woman caught in adultery. Look at his gentleness with the woman with the issue of blood. Look at his gentleness as he handles the children. I mean, what do you do with that? What do you do with that gentleness? And then I remember that verse in the Old Testament. His stooping down, the Hebrew word literally means gentleness. His gentleness is what makes me great. Ah, that's how we are to be. That's how we are to be. Patient in our other relationships. Being patient with one another. (laughs) None of us are perfect yet, brothers and sisters. None of us are perfect by any stretch of the imagination. God's still doing a good work. He's perfecting that good work he began within our lives. And you know what? That means we need to be patient with one another because we're not perfect yet. And then I like that last one. He said, bearing with one another. New Living says, make an allowance for each other's faults. (laughs) Make an allowance for each other's faults. You know the reason Sister Bev still loves me and is married to me after all these years? She has to make allowance for me. (laughs) She has to make allowance for my faults. And you know what? I have to make an allowance for her faults. That's how you have a successful relationship. Now, Brothers and sisters, there's no perfect people in Cathedral of Praise. There's no perfect pastors. Only Jesus is perfect, all right? Only Jesus. And the only way you're going to be able to keep long-term relationships and the only way you're going to be able to stay in a church long-term is you make allowance for one another's faults. Now, when people get super spiritual and they think they're all perfect, then they always want to go out someplace, go out these bunch of, you know? That's not the problem of everybody else. They're just being who they are and God perfecting the good work he began in their life. The problem was with the person who got all spiritually proud and arrogant and thought they were better than everybody else. I can remember the first time I really encountered it. There was a group of people in our church that had a prayer group. And they had their own special name for their prayer group. And they would not allow other people to pray in their prayer group because other people weren't holy enough to pray with them. And I, I just remember thinking, they're not holy enough to pray with you. Huh. I wonder if they let the Apostle Paul in there with all of his faults. How about John? Maybe they'd let Jesus go. And I remember as a young pastor going, how can anybody say you're not holy enough to join us in prayer? It would seem to me that in that time of prayer, you would want them in there in that time of prayer because that's how God changes people. You always find people separating off from the body, not because of everybody else's faults, but because of their pride that they think they're better than everybody else. I'll just leave that one alone. Thirdly, we live worthy by learning to make our calling sure. Now, Second Peter, do I have enough time to finish this? Let me look. No, I don't have enough time to finish this. I'm going to pick this up because this is some really, really good stuff. I'll pick this up tomorrow in Jesus' name. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 5.45 a.m. We'll start with um, Daniel's Prayer, 6 a.m. Devotions. We'll see you then. But until then, remember, there's no perfect people in church, only Jesus. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Sumrall of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Sumrall every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. You are also invited to attend any of the following services at any of the Cathedral of Praise campuses. Every Friday, 6.30 p.m., Saturday, 6 p.m., Sunday, 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. at our COP Main and South Campus parking lots. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. in all Cathedral of Praise campuses. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.